We're here in Stirling. Stirling is famous for all her attractions being up big hills. Here is the castle up a big hill. Here is the Walls Monument up a big hill. Other hand. Here is the Myatt. It is a big hill. That works. That works. That's one big long thing. I don't know if you want to do that a couple of times. Nah, fuck it. That's it. After going up all these big hills, <laughs> I like to go down a wee hill known as Friar Street to relax with a cup of coffee. Coffee. The effects of coffee on humans. I like how we can almost hear the filament of the LEDs going... Genuinely nervous people. You hear the shakes in their tone. You know, it's like... What does coffee do for you? I know what it does for me. It gives me a pick up when I need it. It's there for me when I need it. I spoke to Neil about the impressive machine at the heart of the business. Oof, that is a thing of beauty. So it's a Heeson, uh, which is a Dutch coffee roaster manufacturer and it's called the W6A. The 6 is just alludes to it's a 6 kilogram capacity roaster. Uh, to get kind of optimised coffee roasting we'll put in usually a 4 or a 5 kilogram batch. You don't really want to go to capacity because it's quite tricky to optimise like the, the natural sweetness of the coffee. And from say a 4 kilogram batch that goes in due to like the literally the moisture in the coffee, it vanishes into fresh air. You get about a 3.3 kilogram yield, and it's a beautiful machine. Uh, they call it open flame. It's open flames, drop like touching a cast iron drum, but it does come with like literally brand spanking new Siemens technology. And I think for us as a coffee roasting company, it gave us exactly what we want: complete control. So digital interface. You know, you can augment everything you like the drum pressure, uh, the flame intensity, the heat, absolutely everything. But it still looks a bit Thomas the Tank, Victorian brass, cast iron metal. So everybody comes in, and albeit there is some incredible customers out there, they call it the coffee grinder. It ain't the coffee grinder, it's the coffee roaster. Uh, it did skin us quite a lot of money, but I think it's literally the bloodline and the vital asset of our business. and. It literally hasn't let us down yet to date, so very, very reliable and a stunning bit of kit. Touch wood! <laughs> we then asked what the future holds for the Unorthodox brand. So the next trip is to Indonesia and I think quite exciting, mainly from, dare I say, personal fun territory, as in the food will be incredible, great place to be. Don't really know about it. I know the spoken language is Malay, I believe. Bit of English in there as well, but you know, we'll see how it goes. And yeah, of course, like, they have a whole different variety, if you like, of coffee that we've just not really been exposed to. Uh, we'd like to visit some coffee farms. Uh, they've got a very particular method of processing their coffee there. The wet process is called, like, jilling butter. No doubt I am getting the pronunciation of that wrong, so it'll be like killing butter or something. But that is unique to the area of Indonesia, particularly in Sumatra and Java. So I want to know more about it. I know I could do my Google research and I know that I could all like immediately ask our green bean suppliers, Falcon Specialty, uh, ultimately what was the process. But I think to really get a kind of tactile genuine feeling for what it's all about and how they're doing things over there then the best thing is for Chris and I to visit those coffee farms so that is what we're going to do specifically what ones we don't know yet the green bean merchants will help us probably set up a 
a couple of meetings, you know, we'll do like a cupping, cupping's like a very official way of just making sure that you're tasting the coffee properly at origin, and we do that all the way through, even to like post roasting back in Scotland, so yeah, I think it's a bit of exciting times ahead, the sort of flavour characteristics that will traditionally come out of an Indonesian coffee tend to be a little bit more spicy, a little bit richer, like very, very faint sort of like almost licorice notes, but all very subtle, of course, just a different thing from Latin American coffee and very, very different from African coffees. I would say it feels like the final third of the coffee growing world. So super exciting times and yeah, can't wait to go. The name Unorthodox Roasters is unique in itself. We asked Neil what inspired them to pick that name. Oh, Unorthodox Roasters. It actually has a very, very defined, clear answer and I think a lot of people don't know it until I sporadically talk about it when I'm doing like a front of house shift in either of our cafes. Uh, we were, as I mentioned before, when we went to El Salvador in Huayua and met the gentleman Cesar Magana. They had this beautiful hostel uh, in Santa Ana and at this point in time, Chris and I had kind of thought, we really are going to open a coffee roasting business, that's guaranteed. We'd even mocked up, which we still use today, on a hostel computer with Microsoft Paint or logo. We thought, this doesn't seem to be a name. There's not a name yet that feels synonymous with what we're doing. And I think on the little Sonos speaker in the background, there was a song playing by Wretch32 called, literally, Unorthodox which just so happens to be a sort of remix of a Stone Roses song, Fool's Gold, which I love anyway. And uh, there was a Scottish girl in that hostel at the time, and she turned around to us and said, why do you not call it unorthodox? Because you guys are pretty weird and funky. You know, you're a bit odd. And we were like, eh, that's actually a good idea. Literally, the unorthodox roasters. And people have always said to us before, you should just be a couple of roasters. It'd be simpler that way, because you are a couple of roasters. But we felt, professional and all that jazz sounds a bit different, unorthodox roasters it is, and a name was born. With the rampant consumption of coffee around the world and its environmental impact, we asked Neil about the unorthodox attitude to reducing their carbon footprint and inquired about their coffee cups in contrast to other larger companies and their non-recyclable cups. So one of our kind of original, our first strategy is probably to remove the use of single-use plastic cups just in our cafes. Uh, that'll be encouraging uh, with a sort of pricing strategy, people to bring in a reusable cup and we will provide their takeaway coffee in there. Um, there's actually a small thing going on in Stirling at the moment, a little campaign which I think the council are organising to ensure that all local cafes uh, kind of engage in a sort of reusable, uh, reusable sort of receptacle. So we've gave them all of our support, as soon as they can help make that happen, we will be working together with them. But we might even just march ahead and do it ourselves, because I think sometimes as a small independent, you need to be bold and almost go down a dangerous path, because it can seem scary. The legitimate truth is that that single plastic use cup is horrific for the environment. And even when it goes into the correct bin, even when it's compostable, because ours are compostable, it's the consumer will not always put it in the compostable bin, so there's always going to be issues there. Uh, to kind of like go back a few steps into the, like the green bean purchasing, uh, most of our coffee comes from over on the boat, and I think in terms of sort of the carbon footprint of that from Latin America, it's pretty good. So we like those coffees. Air freight at times is unavoidable if we choose a special Kenyan coffee. That's just the way that the coffee comes to the United Kingdom. Uh, and I suppose, yeah, there's other little elements that are interesting in the total game. You know, how they wash coffees where they're kind of in like scarce supply of fresh water. That'll be like us having a look with the green bean supplier into maybe, you know, drying the coffee, not washing it, and therefore not using the water resources. Sometimes it can be difficult for students to focus on their work in stressful environments. And to me, 
or Orthodox Roasters is the perfect place to relax and focus on your work. But I come here like most every day because <laughs> like I'm very snob with coffees and I can tell they are unbeatable coffees and I like the well the interior as well it's really warm I like the vintage bulb I, I like uh, yeah it's like very conf confined uh, place but I need it to be focused on what I'm doing and I can't revise when I'm home so that's why I'm, I come here. Oh, here, yeah, the, it's just more me here, but here you get more people my age, more people that kind of get it. A little bit funkier through here. Um, I'd love to, but I'd also just love to travel. So if he opened a shop in Tokyo, I would go and I would work there. Because I would love, I like the kind of, I love the thing they do and I like the people that do it. So if I could do this somewhere else but see a different part of the world and do it at the same time, that would be amazing. <laughs>